Perfect. We are live now on YouTube. I really want to welcome all of you into this uh, training and we'll have Miss Priya who will be moderating the session. I thank you so much for attending and hope you enjoy it. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we're really excited uh, as the SDG 16 community to bring forward some useful tools, resources, research, advocacy, uh, you name it, we're bringing it to you uh, this afternoon. Uh, it's about to thunderstorm here in New York City, very hot and humid, uh, but we're really looking forward to having uh, a dynamic discussion with you all. Uh, I'm honored to say that we have uh, our co-hosts, uh, um, Costa Rica, the government of Costa Rica and the government of Cabo Verde with us. Uh, and I am going to read out the partners that are part of this uh, conversation that we're going to have this afternoon, uh, a dynamic set. Uh, I myself are, uh, I'll start with my partner, the Transparency and Accountability Participation Network. Okay. Civil Society Platform for Peace Building and State Building, the Center for Migration, Gender and Justice, Pathfinders for Peaceful, Just and Inclusive Societies, SDG 16 Data Initiative, which is hosted by International IDEA, the United Nations Interregional Crime and Justice Research Institute, and myself and my colleague Kat are here to support uh, the moderation and the facil facilitation of this call. And we're from the Global Alliance for Reporting Progress on Peaceful, Just and Inclusive Societies. As you see in front of you, there's a screen uh, where you can go online or on your phones to slido.com and type in the code and you can help us answer uh, some of the questions that we're going to pose throughout this session. We'd like to try to make it as interactive as possible. As challenging as that is in this, um, in this uh, environment, we're really hoping that we hear from you uh, in other ways and we're really uh, hoping that we can engage with you uh, through this. So right now we're answering, we'd like to know where you are from. We have 96, 97 still going up, uh, participants joining the call. One of the advantages of having it in a virtual space this year is that it opens up our world and we're very grateful for that for those that are based out of New York because it, it's really important for us to to hear from you and to uh, see you quote unquote um, and to get your get a sense of where you're calling in from um, super that there's uh, people logging in from Asia and the Pacific I don't even know what time it is there we have uh, a majority of us are in North America and that makes sense because uh, of the timing of the call um, and we have I think a uh, quite a good balance from Africa uh, equal amounts from Asia Pacific and Europe in Central Asia, uh, and then uh, Latin America. So, and we're missing out on the Arab states, unfortunately. So hopefully one or two of two of you from the Arab states will, uh, will venture on as well. It's probably quite late there as well. Um, but uh, it's really nice to see. We're still increasing in numbers. So let's just give it a, a couple of minutes. 108 participants, which is amazing. Uh, especially during a super uh, busy time with HLPF. There's been numerous, numerous uh, meetings and uh, uh, events this week and launches. Um, so really grateful that you've taken the time to come and be with our, our SDG 16 community today. Um, I would remind you to uh, put your questions in the Q&A. Because it's a, a, this sort of format, we, I will moderate the questions coming in, um, but really encourage you also to put your links, resources, uh, and other uh, material in the chat function. But if you have specific questions, please do put them in the Q&A and uh, my colleagues and myself will do our best to respond to them. Still at 116, so we're still going strong, but I think we're going to start the session because we have a lot to go through. Um, I just wanted to start with a few opening remarks about why we're here today as a SDG 16 community. SDG 16 plus uh, the SDG 16 goal itself is being thematically reviewed uh, this year um, at HLPF. It was this morning, in fact, uh, we had some uh, quite a, a few dynamic conversations and uh, the community of partners that are around the table have come together really to um, to say that we, I think, are really, uh, I think, as as we know, uh, sliding back. Uh, it's been a very, very challenging year for every single person across the, 
the globe, north, south, east, west. Uh, and we have, uh, we're taking a step back in terms of SDG 16 uh, plus. Um, there's no question that uh, we as a community feel it uh, to make, uh, we urgently calling for the SDG 16 community and for member states, private sector, civil society, all the SDG 16 stakeholders uh, engaged throughout the world to urgently make this goal the foundation of reset and recovery um, from COVID-19. Why do we say that? I think we've all witnessed in different ways how institutions have not been up to scruff uh, across the world in terms of the emergency response to the crisis. Uh, and it's uh, these institutions, these strong institutions that we, we fundamentally need going forward to, to, to sort of restart and give us a kickstart uh, on this 2030 agenda. Um, we have nine years left and uh, I wanted to start with one of the, the first recommendations that we are really encouraging here, which is, uh, to display and enact political leadership. Uh, and so without further ado, I wanted to introduce um, the governments uh, of Costa Rica and the governments of um, Cabo Verde uh, to the floor. We'll start with, uh, we'll really speak to why leadership on SDG 16 is imperative right now. And I'm inviting um, Her Excellency Mrs. Fiorella Salazar Rojas. She's the Minister of Justice uh, and peace for the government of, uh, of um, Costa Rica. She has extensive experience working with um, civil society. She's an economist by training. Uh, she's executed several projects to the Inter-American Development Bank related to economy of health, social, uh, and education services. She's also in the last 10 years served as a professor in uh, the Technical Institute of Costa Rica and she is the head of the Justice and Peace portfolio um, and has been since the beginning of the administration. And she's also worked as Deputy Minister of Public Security. So I'd like to welcome uh, Her Excellency. I'd like to thank you uh, and welcome you to the floor. Uh, we have a lot of organizations presenting, so I'd appreciate uh, uh, some timely remarks. Uh, and I will try to give you the signal through Zoom when the eight minutes is up, but thank you, you have the floor. Sí. Muchas gracias. Saludos de buenas tardes desde Costa Rica. Quisiera compartirles en esta tarde algunas ideas de cómo estamos trabajando nosotros este objetivo para llegarle en la meta precisa. Pero antes quisiera enviar un saludo a todas las personas que nos están mirando y nos están escuchando, especialmente a su excelencia, la ministra Joana Gómez Rosa Amado, con quien estoy compartiendo en esta tarde. Muchos saludos. Voy a intentar compartir mi pantalla rápidamente. ¿Por qué necesitamos liderazgo específicamente en este objetivo de desarrollo? Bueno, porque los objetivos de desarrollo son multicolores, son complejos, son globales, son indivisibles, nos llevan a un esfuerzo importante en cada uno de nuestros países y es un ciclo que no termina. Específicamente en el objetivo 16 que tiene que ver con la paz, con la justicia y con las instituciones sólidas, nosotros necesitamos liderazgo para reducir la violencia, para tener acceso a la justicia y garantizárselo a las personas, para tener instituciones sólidas y transparentes, para eliminar corrupción, para terminar con el abuso y la violencia contra los niños y niñas y para asegurar identidades legales para todos. Esto es lo que hemos priorizado en nuestro país en el trabajo. Específicamente, en el tiempo en que estamos viviendo, sabemos que venimos enfrentando una serie de amenazas, los modelos de desarrollo insostenible que venimos desarrollando en los países que realmente nos consumen cada vez más de nuestros recursos y no están generando la equidad que esperábamos, la desigualdad, la discriminación y la exclusión en tiempos de tanta movilidad y múltiples formas de violencia. Ya no solo hablamos de violencia física, evidentemente, sino de muchísimos tipos contra niños, contra mujeres, contra grupos vulnerables. A esto se vino a sumar desde el año pasado la situación que experimenta el mundo con la pandemia por el COVID-19. Entonces, Pensamos en nuestro país que es importante hacer un análisis desde varias perspectivas. 
desde el entorno global, en el planeta en el que estamos, que cada vez es un, un planeta más chiquito pensando en comunicaciones y pensando en transporte, en el entorno nacional, cómo cada país está enfrentando sus propios desafíos y al nivel local, es decir, con las comunidades donde está la gente en su espacio específico. Nosotros en Costa Rica tenemos una guía para afrontar esta serie de amenazas y para plantear los, los objetivos que queremos lograr. Lo llamamos el Plan Nacional de Desarrollo e Inversión Pública del Bicentenario. Y lo llamamos del Bicentenario porque Costa Rica este año estará celebrando en el mes de septiembre los 200 años de vida independiente como república. Entonces, hemos cifrado en este plan las metas que queremos lograr en todos los aspectos del quehacer del país y en la parte de seguridad humana estamos incluyendo lo que tiene que ver con alcanzar el objetivo número 16. Específicamente, ¿a qué nos, nos estamos refiriendo? Nos estamos refiriendo a asuntos programáticos, a temas de intervenciones específicas. Algunas de ellas son estas. Tenemos una política nacional para la igualdad efectiva entre los hombres y las mujeres que tienen un horizonte de cumplimiento al año 2030. Una política nacional para la atención y prevención de la violencia contra las mujeres de todas las edades. Y esta la tenemos con un horizonte al 2032. Tenemos una estrategia nacional de lucha contra la legitimación de capitales y financiamiento del terrorismo. Tenemos una estrategia social que hemos denominado Puente al Desarrollo y que se encarga de llegar a las comunidades, a los grupos y a las familias a través de cogestores sociales que buscan identificar las necesidades de las familias y poder atenderlo a través de las, disti las distintas ofertas programáticas del Estado. Tenemos una Agenda Nacional de Prevención de la Violencia. Hemos desarrollado y estamos desarrollando con los municipios en diferentes partes del país una estrategia que se denomina Sembremos Seguridad. Y tenemos evidentemente un marco normativo para luchar contra la criminalidad organizada. En términos muy específicos, desde lo que hacemos en el Ministerio de Justicia y Paz, tenemos en funcionamiento siete centros cívicos por la paz. En este momento me encuentro en uno de ellos y estamos por iniciar la construcción de ocho más. Tenemos 15 casas de justicia en operación, que son espacios para el desarrollo de resolución alterna de conflictos. Tenemos procesos comunitarios como los que se desarrollan en los centros cívicos, pero los denominamos sin paredes. En ambos casos, los centros cívicos se refieren a intervenciones en arte, en deporte, en tecnología, en cultura, para niños, niñas y jóvenes que puedan sentir que la sociedad los está incluyendo y sentirse parte de ella a través de una serie de intervenciones que buscan también crear una cultura de paz y enfrentar las causas de la violencia. Hacemos prevención trabajando en los centros cívicos. Tenemos un observatorio de la violencia que se encarga de recopilar información y ponerla a disposición de los operadores del sector. Tenemos procesos de educación para la paz, redes de jóvenes que trabajan en prevención de la violencia, control de los contenidos violentos que se ven en televisión, en cine o en videojuegos. Tenemos estrategias locales de prevención de la violencia a nivel de las comunidades y trabajamos también con procesos de consulta indígena. Realmente en el país incluimos a todas las poblaciones para que nadie se quede atrás. Esto nos ha llevado a tener unas 48 estrategias cantonales de prevención de la violencia, es decir, a nivel de la unidad administrativa más pequeña que tiene nuestro país, que son los cantones. Unas 25 mil personas se benefician de los programas que nosotros realizamos a través de estas intervenciones que les mencionaba. Y participamos en más de 100 procesos preventivos interinstitucionales en los cuales estamos acompañando con la oferta programática del Ministerio de Justicia y Paz. Además, alimentamos los datos nacionales que tienen que ver con la prevención de la violencia. Es una variedad importante de intervenciones las que hacemos, mucho trabajando con otras organizaciones del sector público, pero también con organizaciones del sector privado, uniendo esfuerzos y haciendo alianzas. ¿Qué experiencias hemos tenido? ¿Qué resultados hemos ido viendo del trabajo con los centros cívicos, con las comunidades, ahí donde ellas están? Hemos visto que el índice de los victimarios menores de edad con respecto a las tabulaciones nacionales disminuyó. Hemos visto que las tasas de asalto con respecto a la tasa nacional en esas comunidades donde hacemos intervenciones ha disminuido. 
la relación entre el índice de robos y asaltos autorreportados con respecto a la tasa nacional también ha disminuido específicamente en esas comunidades. La relación del índice de percepción de seguridad con respecto al nivel nacional, en este caso aumentó, es una noticia muy positiva. La tasa de asaltos específicamente en esas comunidades disminuyó y la tasa de homicidios no aumentó. Esos son indicadores que nos hacen ver que las intervenciones que se están haciendo lideradas por el Ministerio, pero en conjunto con otras instituciones del sector seguridad y con otras instituciones del sector salud, están rindiendo frutos. Trabajamos muchísimo en prevención. Esa es la apuesta que hace el país desde las edades tempranas de nuestros niños y niñas. Trabajamos tanto prevención secundaria como prevención terciaria. Es decir, estamos incorporando no solo la gente que está en sociedad civil, sino el trabajo también con las poblaciones penitenciarias que tenemos en nuestro servicio, a quienes servimos, y con sus familiares. Intentamos crear una red que le dé contención y que nos permita darle más oportunidades a las personas, sobre todo cuando vuelven a la vida en libertad, para que no vuelvan, para que no reincidan en los delitos que originalmente cometieron y que los han llevado a estar en este momento en el sistema penitenciario. Adicionalmente, el país ha hecho un esfuerzo durante el último año por crear una estrategia de prevención de la corrupción, una estrategia nacional de, de integridad, en la que han participado ah. representantes del sector público, del sector privado y de la sociedad civil. Lo que tratamos de crear con esta John estrategia Paul. es la, la visión Paul. que el país ah, tiene sí. de atender los temas relacionados con el fortalecimiento de nuestras instituciones desde una perspectiva multisectorial. La pregunta que nosotros hemos tratado de respondernos y que tratamos de responder en esta oportunidad aquí en esta conversación es por qué necesitamos el liderazgo en relación con los objetivos y específicamente con el número 16. Bueno, nosotros creemos que este liderazgo es la herramienta que une y que nos permitirá lograr efectivamente los objetivos. De momento, esto es lo que traía para compartir con ustedes. Quedo a la orden para cualquier consulta o comentario. Gracias. Thank you, Minister. Uh, it's a uh, uh, very thoughtful uh, presentation that you've just made, uh, really focused on the prevention aspects and the culture of peace, which is quite remarkable. Uh, I'd also like to highlight Costa Rica's work going forward, that they will be the host of the uh, 2021 uh, annual showcase uh, um, for SDG 16. Uh, which is going to be held in December, and we can put uh, links in the chat, but they're a true leader and they have really been a, a, a huge supporter that over the last two years through this difficult time because they were supposed to hold it last year. And so they are uh, going to hopefully, fingers crossed, have their event in person and where all of us can uh, continue this dialogue. I have the honor of introducing our next, uh, um, uh, Her Excellency, and I'm very proud to say uh, that there's two females opening this uh, wonderful workshop and that the future is female. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce Her Excellency, Ms. Joana Gomez Rosa Amado. She's the Minister of Justice for the government of Cabo Verde. She was elected deputy of the nation and held the functions of vice president of the parliamentary uh, bench. She's also been the vice president of the network of women parliamentarians and has worked extensively with committees on legal matters and specifically with the legal affairs committee. Her uh, professional experience also includes working with the World Bank, FAO, and the president of the municipal assembly of the city council of Mayo. Without further ado, please take the floor. Thank you. Good morning. Painel, saudar também em especial a Sra. Ministra de Justiça e Paz da, da Costa Rica. Uh, vamos começar a nossa uh, apresentação. Uh, localizado na costa ocidental africana, uh, a 500 km de Senegal, uh, Cabo Verde é um arquipélago composto por 10 ilhas de origem vulcânica, com uma área terrestre de 4.033 km quadrados e uma vasta zona económica exclusiva de cerca de 734 mil quilómetros quadrados, o equivalente a cerca de 183 vezes a superfície terrestre. Em Cabo Verde, sistemas e instituições fortes 
constituem pilares essenciais dos aceleradores do desenvolvimento sustentável. Cabo Verde lidera em África o essencial dos rankings de desenvolvimento humano, transparência, liberdades e boa governança. A credibilidade externa é um dos maiores ativos do país e é, sobretudo, o resultado do percurso democrático, da transparência e da boa governação. Cabo Verde propugna uma cultura de paz, de conhecimento, defesa e observância dos deveres dos cidadãos. Uma justiça eficaz, inclusiva e promotora da competitividade. Cabo Verde assume como desafios a promoção dos direitos humanos, da cidadania e da justiça, o reforço da administração da proteção dos direitos dos cidadãos, garantir ao cidadão o acesso à justiça e ao direito, um ambiente securitário que promove o pleno desenvolvimento e a prosperidade dos cidadãos num contexto de paz, de segurança, exercício consciente e participativo da cidadania e respeito pelos direitos fundamentais do ser humano. Reduziu-se a percepção da insegurança. Cabo Verde é o único país em África classificado com um nível insignificante de insegurança, cujo risco é mais reduzido para a segurança nas viagens de turistas. Cinco anos de avanços em matéria de justiça, paz, boa governação, parcerias e de consolidação das instituições democráticas e de reforço das condições de estabilidade, mas também de compromissos de longo prazo para o desenvolvimento sustentável. Nestes cinco anos, reduziu-se significativamente a violência e a mortalidade relacionada. Há uma boa previsão e execução das despesas primárias. E um nível elevado de execução das despesas primárias, com 93,3% em 2019 e 91% em 2020. Houve um desempenho das receitas fiscais que permitiram financiar, em período de pandemia, cerca de 59,4% do orçamento executado, 176,8% em 2019. Temos uma liberdade de imprensa internacionalmente reconhecida e um Conselho Independente da Rádio e Televisão Cabo Verdeana nomeado sem interferência do Governo. A Comissão Nacional dos Direitos Humanos, da Nania, é uma instituição nacional independente de direitos humanos. A não ocasionou alterações estruturais no ordenamento jurídico do sistema de gestão das finanças públicas. O, a título transitório, foram feitas algumas alterações e adequações organizacionais nos procedimentos e nas agendas de trabalho. Desde 2016, inauguramos uma nova era de relacionamento com o poder local. Foram criadas plataformas para o desenvolvimento local e localização dos ODS, elaborados pela MDS, alinhados ao PED e aos ODS. Passos seguros foram dados na área da reforma da administração pública. Apenas cerca de 19,5% dos reclusos são preventivos, ou seja, detenções não sentenciadas. O Governo, através do Ministério da Justiça, garante o acesso à justiça. Cabe ver dotado de um quadro jurídico e institucional que é consistente com o perfil de risco de branqueamento de capitais no país. Os sindicatos exercem livremente a sua missão e são parte de acordo de concertação estratégica para o período 2017-2021. Os jornalistas estão organizados em associação sindical e existe uma agência reguladora da comunicação social. As autoridades cabo-verdianas reforçam a descentralização, apostam no desenvolvimento local, regional e na convergência dos municípios das ilhas para os ODS. Renovam o compromisso com a democracia, com a transparência e a boa governação e promoverão a consolidação da democracia cabo-verdiana, designadamente com a transformação digital da administração pública central e local para acelerar a transparência e o controle da ação pública. Reforçarão o papel do Ministério das Finanças como líder do Sistema Nacional de Planeamento, com ênfase no monitoramento e avaliação, e por esta via garantirão a efetividade do controle social e político 
e a realização progressiva do desenvolvimento sustentável. Ainda, as autoridades cabo-verdianas garantem o um funcionamento em pleno do Conselho das Finanças Públicas e assim o um reforço dos mecanismos de garantia da consistência e do cumprimento e sustentabilidade da política orçamental. Reforço os mecanismos de prevenção da corrupção com o funcionamento do Conselho de Prevenção contra a Corrupção. Assumem promover uma democracia mais participativa, visando a proteção e promoção dos direitos dos cidadãos e o aprimoramento permanente do Estado de Direito Democrático, com o reforço das funções legislativas e fiscalizadora, mas também da proximidade. Assumem a modernização progressiva das instituições democráticas, a consolidação da independência e do pluralismo da comunicação social, a promoção de políticas e espaços de debate, assegurando uma participação inclusiva e representativa dos processos de decisão a todos os níveis, em particular dos jovens e das mulheres. Acabo de fazer a minha apresentação, fico também à disponibilidade para algumas questões Uh, portanto, responder algumas questões. Uh, uh, Muito obrigada a todos. Thank you, uh, Minister, and thank you for being so timely as well. Uh, we recognize that uh, both uh, ministers have mentioned uh, the focus on prevention, but also the focus on anti-corruption. And what is close to my heart and what I, we've been talking about for the last many months is also the, the conversation around localization and how imperative it is right now to really engage with those uh, that are not seen in, in the big cities uh, that are harder to reach. Uh, and that raises the question of you know, participation and inclusivity very much attached to SDG 16. I'd also like to point out that the Global Alliance and several of our UN partners have uh, engaged very much with the Praia City Group. They have a great resource, which I'll put in the chat later, on measuring governance statistics, but also measuring um, governance statistics during this time of COVID-19. So very much relevant to what uh, challenges are being faced right now. Uh, and also a true leader. Thank you again to both ministers. Uh, we'll move it along uh, to an exciting poll <laughs> to start off the, seg and the next segment. Since there's quite a few speakers, we wanted to break it up a bit and get a sense from this community of right now 150 plus people. Again, just go to slido.com um, and put in the code there. It's 364 space 125. And if you were going to, you know, that session was really to talk about leadership and we have two government leaders here really advancing work on SDG 16. Um, what do you think is the most pressing challenges for governments to lead on SDG 16 going forward? Uh, and thank you, Ellery, for putting that in. You can join on your laptop, computer, iPhone or iPad. Just type in the browser slide, slido.com. Thank you. I'll give it a little bit more time to populate, but I hope it's working from your end. We're seeing uh, financing is uh, the largest so thus far. Uh, let's see what else populates here. Inequality. Corruption, political will, crime, justice. This is another, uh, you know, as I see this, the challenge as we work on a goal 16 on peace, justice and inclusion, there's so many areas within this one that are packed into this one uh, sustainable development goal that it's, it's can at times be overwhelming, but there are, you know, the topics, the thematic areas are coming up in terms of justice, corruption, uh, acts, um, leadership, inclusion, crime. Uh, we're also seeing violence, in the smaller tabs, uh, collaboration, violence against children, peace, coordination, collaboration, freedom, um, <laughs> incompetence. <laughs> That's an interesting one. Uh, political 
polarization. Even food is showing up in resources. Um, let's see what else populates. Corruption right now is, is showing uh, larger than financing even. And both of the, our ministers spoke to that uh, issue because it is in fact uh, one of the and it's very much related to financing, you know, how much money is lost to corruption um, and all that money could be invested in the country itself. Um, so that's a huge, huge challenge. If you're having problems, just, uh, you know, put it in the chat and we can also help you uh, access uh, slido.com. values people are putting in the chat unless I can't access it for some reason. Generation gap, that's an interesting one, checks and balances, and that leads back to transparency. The number on the right is how many participants responded, Kat, I guess, 33 or not? That's just random. It's hard to see how many people have responded, but. Any other new ones, populism? I haven't seen it yet, but I think it's in reference there, but you know, shrinking civic space. Um, and uh, trust, which are all two, uh, also two big issues that have come to the fore uh, during this pandemic, especially. It's, uh, I think there's a spell check, it's Slido, remember, S-L-I-D-O dot com, not slide, so Slido, it's a little bit slick. <laughs> I think Rafida asked that question. Shall we leave it there? Kat, thanks. We will of course post these images um, for us to process uh, after the session, but that was a, an interesting cloud that formed quite off the, off the bat it was financing, but then corruption really took center stage. And, and like I said before, made sense of, of why, why that's such a huge challenge. Um, Without further ado, because time is ticking, I wanted to introduce the two next presenters. Uh, the two, uh, the session will focus on human rights and justice, and it really looks to more of the research uh, around uh, two of the thematic areas that have uh, the recent research that has come out. So the first speaker, uh, her name is Dr. Lara Zuzan Golsorki. She's the executive director for the Center for Migration. And she uh, is an assistant professor uh, of political science and global affairs um, at the University of Portland and the founder of the uh, and executive director uh, of the Center for Migration, Justice, uh, Gender and Justice, CNGJ. Uh, she will be speaking to, Dr. Golsorki will be speaking to uh, the issue of outlying findings from her NGO's report on migration, gender and labor and SDG 16 on the case of Germany. And then also outlining, outlining the role of CSOs and BNRs in national development planning as a way of holding governments accountable. Um, and I will also introduce the following speaker because it's related. Um, his name is Mr. Odran McCarthy. He's speaking on behalf of the director uh, at the UN Interregional Crime and Justice Research Institute. And he will be sharing insights on shaping more effective work on SDG 16 through evidence-based tailored and whole of society approach, providing example from UNICRI's applied research in preventing radicalization in the Sahel Maghreb region. So both of you have eight minutes and I will wave and shake as much as I can if it goes a bit over, but uh, over to you, uh, Lara Zuzan. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen to get my presentation uh, going. Um, I would like to begin by thanking uh, UNITAR for providing this opportunity for all of us 
to come together around a, such an important learning experience. And I also would like to thank our partners in this specific event for creating a platform for civil society organizations, such as the Center for Migration, Gender and Justice to share our work and to speak about the role of civil society organizations in voluntary national reviews and national development planning as a means of holding governments accountable. The Center for Migration, Gender and Justice or CMGJ is a nonprofit NGO that addresses human rights at the intersection of migration and gender. And we're women led, we're migrant led and youth led and youth inspired. Um, we launched the Center for Migration, Gender and Justice last year out of the belief that gender justice goes beyond borders and that gender justice beyond borders necessitates shared agency representation and accountability um, in protecting human rights for all. And it is because of this vision that we are here today. So for my presentation, I would like to outline findings from our report, Migration, Gender and Labor, the case of Germany. Um, and this report, which we're launching today in the context of this event, is the result of a collaborative research project with one of our community partner organizations, WOW With or Without. And as part of our collaborative work, we collected data at various programs for refugee women in June, July, 2019. And this data speaks to various SDGs that are important to consider in labor market participation of refugee women, namely SDG 5, 8, 10, 16, and 17. But for today, I'll focus on SDG um, 16 specifically. And then from there, I will outline the um, role of CSOs in VNRs and national development planning as a way of holding governments accountable. And um, through that, I will announce our new project, um, Migration and the EU Gender Equality Strategy, which was selected as an SDG good practice by UNDESA. So the project then really exemplifies how CSOs can bridge accountability processes across the international, regional, and national level. And it also emphasizes the critical role that civil society organizations play in achieving Agenda 2030. So as mentioned, the focus of our collaborative community-based research was on refugee women in the German labor market. And in our report, we draw on data collection and observations at empowerment and anti-discrimination workshops with refugee women, upon which we have identified the listed factors as informing labor market participation of refugee women in Germany. And these factors were self-reported or self-identified by the women. So language skills, professional development and education, sociocultural dynamics such as household structures and also self-determination for instance. And our findings are reflected in government data sets in that uh, what can be referred to as a refugee gender gap exists in the German labor market. And this refugee gender gap is evidenced in underemployment rates, in type of employment and in wage differences. So just to highlight a few points here, um, as of 2020, 6% of refugee women are employed compared to 27% of refugee men. And out of the 6% that are employed, one third are underemployed, so working below their professional and educational attainment. Refugee women are also three times more likely to hold part-time jobs than refugee men. And similar to us, some of the factors that contribute to this that were found by um, government data sets um, include language skills, completion of integration programs, participation in professional advising services and household structures. So lots of overlaps between our community-based research as well as what um, government data shows. So then what does this have to do with SDG 16 and what does it mean for accountability processes? Um, refugee women deserve peace, justice and strong institutions in their host communities. And for Germany to achieve SDG 16 relative to labor market participation of refugee women, um, this necessitates a rethinking of the current socio-legal framework that governs refugee women's livelihoods. And we find that an anti-discriminatory and gender responsive trajectory is indeed necessary for this. Such trajectory must be intersectional given the complexity of refugee women's experiences. 
intersectional challenges are rarely reflected in big data assessments, while they often represent a particularly pressing issue concerning labor market participation, again, as evidence in our community-based work. So we just recommend an intersectional approach to law and policy making that matches the complexity of challenges that refugee women face in the labor market. So, does, so then how do we facilitate these partnerships um, and around these recommendations? In putting research um, and our research findings into action, we submitted our migration and the EU gender equality strategy project in the second call for SDG good practices by UNDESA. And the project aims to uh, bridge gaps between migration policy and gender policy in the European Union by tracking and assessing the implementation of the strategy in centering um, migration. So in focusing on four areas of the strategy, we provide targeted analyses and recommendations for a migrant inclusive gender equal Europe. And these analyses and recommendations are based on consultations with our advisory groups, which include um, migrant communities and local NGOs that work with migrant communities across Europe. And the project's finding carry importance beyond regional bounds. Indeed, our intersectional approach speaks to the interconnectedness of the SDGs and hereby contributes to achieving Agenda 2030. So in conclusion, then in many ways, our engagement with Germany's voluntary national review and national development planning led us to conceptualize this transnational project that centers the experiences of those often left behind while facilitating a robust accountability mechanism that is supported um, and situated within a um, UN framework. And several European countries were up to submit a VNR this year and others will be in the next few years. So we hope to incorporate this into the ongoing project, just as we did with Germany. And with this, I would like to um, thank you and um, I look forward to further discussion and collaboration. Thank you so much. Uh, super relevant again, um, a lot of information packed into a short presentation, but we uh, uh, it resonated in terms of uh, the issue of participation uh, and inequality and how that is uh, resonates down the line uh, e economically in this case for uh, refugees uh, who are female or at, at the intersectionality of that conversation. Um, without further ado, uh, please put your questions in the Q&A as we go. We will get to them towards the end, but you know, if questions pop up, please do put them in the Q&A and we will address them towards the end of the session. Um, I wanted to now introduce Odran McCarty, who will speak. There he is uh, next. Go for it, Odran. Great. Thank you very much, Priya. And good afternoon to everybody from uh, New York. My name is Oren McCarthy. I'm the liaison officer for UNICRI, which is the United Nations Interregional Crime and Justice Research Institute. And um, as Priya mentioned, unfortunately, it was foreseen that um, our director, Ms. Antonia De Mayo, would uh, deliver these remarks. But um, unfortunately, the, due to unforeseen circumstances, she couldn't join us here today. So please apologies, uh, please accept apologies um, from uh, Mr. Mayo to all of you. Um, so without further ado, I'm just going to deliver the statement on, um, on our director's behalf and afterwards I'm happy to take any questions. Um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, it's a pleasure to join you here today and to speak to you on behalf of the United Nations Interregional Crime and Justice Research Institute, UNICRI. Allow me to briefly acknowledge our hosts in UNITAR and UNDESA for facilitating this platform and to all our co-organizers of the session on SDG 16. I would like to also acknowledge the presence of Her Excellency Fiorella Salazar Rojas, Minister of Justice and Peace of the Government of Costa Rica, and Her Excellency Joana Gomez Rosa Amado, Minister of Justice of the Government of Cabo Verde. I believe I do not need to explain the importance of Goal 16 of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Your presence here alone is testament to the fact that you appreciate the importance of striving for peace, justice, and strong institutions. Allow me just to say that goal 16 is a goal, yes, but it is also an integral part of the agenda for sustainable development as a whole. In many ways, it is the key to ensuring uh, that the sustainable development goals can be accomplished and indeed sustained into the future. With SDG 16... Well, hold on, sorry, the interpreters are asking you to slow down a little bit. <laughs> apologies. Yes, go for it. 
Um, with SDG 16, we are planting the seeds for change. If the conditions are not right, the plant will not take root, or worse, it may rot. As we know, the COVID-19 pandemic has forced the world into a moment of transformative change. This transform transformative change also necessarily affects how the United Nations delivers upon the Sustainable Development Goals to achieve a better future for all, amidst what may well be the largest crisis of our time. The cross-cutting nature of SDG 16 to promote peaceful, just and inclusive societies free from crime and violence can also guide our pandemic recovery at all levels, whilst under underscoring the integrated, interlinked and indiv indivisible nature of all the SDGs. As you may know, UNICRI is a United Nations Research and Training Institute tasked with supporting member states and the international community at large to tackle the threats that crime poses, including to social peace, development and political stability. Our overarching aim is to foster the development of just and efficient criminal justice systems. We are in fact one of the few United Nations entities whose mandate is focused exclusively on SDG 16. UNICRI applies action-oriented research uh, to guide our specialized capacity building programs to address emerging trends and developments. Throughout our 50 year plus history, we have made an impact across the world by implementing our two key pillars of our mandate, research and training within an ever evolving landscape of crime prevention and criminal justice. As criminal elements take advantage of the vulnerabilities in our society, in particular as exposed by the COVID-19 pandemic, this work is increasingly relevant. Our work touches upon governance, institutional and policy innovations at local, national, regional and international levels that can contribute to accelerating the implementation of SDG 16. Uh, it promotes breaking down traditional silos and a multi-stakeholder and whole of society approach. It is framed around the ability to fail and in doing so to learn from our failure as we tackle complex interrelated challenges. Please allow me to share one example of some of Unicree's experiences in this regard. In 2015, Unicree launched its program on countering radicalization and violent extremism in the Sahel Maghreb region, an ambitious initiative that sought to work with civil society organizations in nine countries of the region in order to pilot and evaluate small scale interventions of a varying nature. The ultimate goal of our work was to understand what works and what does not work in terms of strengthening the resilience of local communities to radicalization and violent extremism. After five years of work with more than 80 sub projects comprised of more than 500 activities in such in areas such as theater, art and sports involving more than 23,000 individuals, Unicure released its report, Many Hands on an Elephant, late last year, which represents the finding of our applied research. We have also related, released related reports, including When the Music Stops, the impact of terrorism on Malian youth, which builds upon this work. This combined corpus uh, of research shares the main lessons learned and provides evidence-based recommendations to the international community to help inform more effective future interventions. Violent extremism is a phenomenon, as a phenomenon is difficult to define and therefore to prevent. In this regard, Unicri adopted a practical approach Focusing, uh, the analysis, focusing on the analysis of the grievances reported by local communities and on the drivers described as critical in pushing young people to join violent extremist groups. Not surprisingly, all the grievances referred to structural, social, political and economic issues and hence require long-term developmental solutions. However, through this initiative, several civil society organizations developed tools and approaches that aided them in sidestepping these structural factors whilst identifying other solutions to successfully address specific aspects of different grievances. Despite everything we learned, the challenge remains to define, implement and coordinate an effective and long-term course of action, where member states are of course the primary actors, but civil society and local communities are also integrated as key partners. Local knowledge to identify local grievances and local ability and intuition to devise made to measure solutions have proven to be essential. Approaches must be tailored to specific communities and based upon an assessment of actual and perceived obstacles to participation. Cookie cutter approaches will not suffice to enable meaningful participation by youth and women in communities vulnerable to violent extremism. Tackling the challenge of violent extremism, like many other issues we face under SDG 16, requires a comprehensive whole of society approach grounded in supporting local actors and communities to address not only the immediate effects, but also the root causes. I'm grateful for the opportunity to briefly share with you a little bit about Unicree and some of the lessons we have learned from this highly rewarding initiative. 
I believe our experiences can help to contribute to shaping more effective work on SDG 16 as a whole and to help us to achieve our ambitious goals of promoting healthy, peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development. I thank you all for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, uh, Udran. That was also uh, very relevant in terms of um, uh, the role of youth, really, uh, and tying it back to inequalities, uh, participation, lack thereof, and um, economic challenges, all uh, very much tied to goal 16, to peace, basically, um, and justice, and how um, um, Unicri is trying to support um, uh, this work through uh, capacitizing the civil society organizations, also getting out to more local, uh, trying to find more local solutions uh, in terms of the more rural and outlying areas. So thank you for that. Um, we have, I think, one more, if I'm not, yes, mistake, not mistaken, one more poll, and this is the last one. Um, let it just come up. You can join uh, at the on the left hand side of your screen. It's slido.com and the code is 364125. And the question is, in what word, what more can be done to place human rights and justice for all at the forefront of work on the SDGs? Um, let's see what comes up. Participation is taking uh, center stage alongside transparency. Respect is a different uh, word that we have not seen. Respect for others, I guess. Yes, respect is a good one. It's an interesting way to to phrase it, but it's very much tied to trust building. Uh, education, someone is saying in the chat because I can't access it. So we have transparency, rule of law, respect, partnerships, empowerment. Um, concept of social safety, um, teaching people comes up quite a bit. Youth-centered programs. Here in New York, we're having a bit of a thunderstorm. So I, I, in, my, in my world, that's a good thing. We're being encouraged to continue to speak loudly and storm about this issue and really try to uh, build awareness and advocacy around these issues, but also uh, listen. Genuine care has, is there. So I, I feel like in this one, there's more empath empath empathetic responses, love, honesty, trust. Um, at the in, in essence, uh, when we talk about human rights, the rights of people uh, to be treated with equal uh, equality and to be respected and to be heard, social harmony. Great. I think uh, it's slowing down a bit, but I think we get a sense of where we're at with this inspiring um, and a useful reminder to all of us when we are doing our work, our day-to-day -day work to, to live by many of these principles and to work by many of these principles. Um, I think we'll carry on. Uh, 
we have four more speakers and we're gonna i'm gonna split them up in two groups um now we're going to look to uh two of our civil society uh partners uh who work very much with the un as well uh, and look at some of the tools that are uh, available to this community uh, of people wanting to advance and implement sdg 16. so first i'll introduce um massimo Tomo Tomasoli, he's the uh, Director of Global Programs and Permanent Observer for International IDEA to the United Nations. He'll be speaking on the SDG uh, 16 Data Initiative, which is uh, a collective project, which he can speak more to. Uh, and he's uh, speaking from Italy, I believe, today. So welcome, Massimo. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Priya, for giving me the floor. And many thanks for the invitation. I'm going to share my screen. And I will start my presentation. I have just uh, three slides. I want, uh, first of all, to uh, thank and agree also the ministers of justice of Costa Rica and uh, Cabo Verde for their inspiring uh, introduction. Uh, the uh, Sustainable uh, Development Goal 16 data initiative is a consortium of uh, 17 partner organizations that seek to support the open and holistic tracking of the commitments made by UN member states captured in SDG 16 and the 17 members of the partnership uh, have a diverse range of organizational focuses. They cover essentially the three main areas, broad areas uh, that uh, are uh, contained in the definition of the SDG 16, uh, peaceful, just and inclusive uh, societies. Uh, the, uh, as you all know, the um, member states uh, through the UN Statistical Commission, identified a number of indicators. These are official indicators on which there is agreement based on the methodology, uh, on the availability of uh, data, and uh, on the uh, collection, uh, actual collection and analysis of these data. Uh, however, some of these uh, indicators capture only the quantitative dimensions of the targets of SDG 16. So together with these uh, partner organizations, uh, a consortium of civil society and international organizations tried to address and fill the gap that exists in uh, some of the uh, target areas particularly uh, because of the lack of uh, uh, perception-based and experience-based indicators that are so important in order to understand uh, the behavior and the perceptions of the trends on the implementation of SDG 16 and the broader 2030 agenda. So uh, combining uh, official and non-official data for monitoring progress on SDG 16 plus is the main aim of this initiative. Uh, what do we do? We produce, uh, first of all, a data that are collected in a database accessible through sdg16.org. And we produce also analysis of these data uh, through a, an annual global report. You can see here uh, the uh, the cover of the last report from last year and uh, the logos of the 17 organizations that uh, participate uh, in its production. Some of these organizations are actually producing the non-official indicators that complement the official indicators. Others are uh, collecting and combining, compiling uh, sources from other uh, organizations. Uh, these data, however, have to uh, comply with uh, the basic requirements that are also requested by the UN Statistical Commission for the official data in terms of data quality, availability, and coverage. 
In other words, uh, the aim of the SDG 16 data initiative uh, is to populate the landscape of indicators that monitor progress on the implementation of SDG 16 with a wider range of data that capture also perceptions and experiences of ordinary citizens in the implementation of the data, of the agenda. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, on uh, um, the target 16.5, which is about corruption, uh, the uh, complementary global indicator uh, is the corruption perception index score. Um, when it comes to political uh, participation, uh, the uh, complementary uh, indicator is the percentage of seats uh, of uh, women in uh, lower uh, houses. Um, there are other indicators that are uh, sex disaggregated. Uh, on violence, for example, we attach great importance uh, on uh, an indicator uh, that uh, measures the perception of uh, uh, or experience of violence in uh, uh, women, uh, which, uh, which is an extremely important uh, element in order to capture uh, violence uh, in the domestic sphere and also violence against women more broadly. Uh, the uh, other element, as I said, uh, that we make available for voluntary national review processes and civil society organizations that want to use uh, these uh, data sets for uh, carrying out their own analysis at the country or regional level is the um, website. Here you have an indication of our website. Uh, I repeat it, www.sdg16.org. In this website, you can find uh, the uh, aggregated uh, indicators for uh, the uh, official uh, data and uh, the uh, non-official data. Uh, and uh, in this way, you may actually uh, make also comparisons across regions or between different countries on the basis of the data updated uh, up to uh, last year. One final word about the challenge posed by the pandemic, uh, specifically to the area of collecting and analyzing data uh, that are uh, perception or experience based. One of the main uh, uh, tools for collecting these data are surveys. And clearly the uh, constraints posed uh, by the pandemic, especially through uh, measures uh, of social distancing have created barriers towards the collection and analysis of these data. Uh, the SDG 16 data initiative uh, partnered with the uh, Praia uh, Group on Governance Indicators, uh, which has actually analyzed the methodological and practical challenges of dealing with this issue over the last uh, two years by producing also analytical and methodological tools. So we do compare notes with uh, the uh, national statistical offices engaged in developing governance statistics for uh, the purpose of uh, collecting reliable data uh, also during the time of the pandemic and in its aftermath. Thank you very much, Priya. Thank you, Massimo. Uh, it's a topic close to my heart. I never thought I would be uh, a data geek, but uh, and I'm not a statistician or a data expert, but uh, the, the concept of unofficial versus official data and quality data is what we're trying to really get at at the end of the day and bringing those two spheres together as much as possible uh, is imperative, I think. Uh, member states are trying their best. Uh, it's a very, uh, it's one of the, I think listed as one of the most challenging issues is the data uh, collection and creation for SDG 16. It is hard to measure getting a little bit easier as time goes on, you know, people get grasping it a bit in different ways, uh, but we really see a value in bringing together, again, civil society with member states in a complementary approach 
to a deriving uh, quality data. Thanks for that, Cosimo. Uh, without further ado, I'll introduce John Romano. He's a close partner of Global Alliances. He uh, is the coordinator of the Transparency, Accountability, and Participation Network uh, based here in New York. The network is a a broad international coalition of CSOs working together to advance SDG 16, really to promote peace, justice, and inclusive societies, and to help enhance accountability of the 2030 agenda. And he has a, a, a great tool that he launched this morning, that they launched this morning, the TAP Network, and I will let him uh, speak to that tool for, uh, for all of the community here today. John, over to you. Uh, great, thanks a lot, Priya, and thanks, uh, thanks again to you and Desa and Yutar for, for hosting us in this session and uh, to all of you for joining us. Um, as, as Priya mentioned, yeah, I'll uh, detail uh, what we call the SDG 16 plus uh, civil society toolkit, uh, which as Priya mentioned, we officially launched uh, this morning. Um, but just first, uh, just a brief uh, introduction to the TAP network for those of you that, that we haven't worked with before. Uh, we are a global network of civil society, um, over 230 organizations uh, working on SDG 16 plus, uh, but also on accountability for the 2030 agenda. Uh, I think from, uh, from our perspective, I mean, there are many things that we work on. Um, you can see uh, a few examples of some of the resources that we've produced around these topics um, over here in the slide. Uh, but I mean, generally speaking, I think we work uh, towards um, strengthening the capacity of our civil society partners, particularly at the national and local level, uh, to help them make sense of what, uh, what they can do to advance SDG 16 plus. So this resource, uh, we hope, is a, is a use, useful resource for, for colleagues to help them, uh, to help colleagues work with SDG 16 uh, plus. Um, so just um, a little bit of information about the toolkit itself. Um, I think just for starters, it's very easy to access. It's, um, you just visit uh, www.sdg16toolkit.org. Um, basically, again, as I mentioned, uh, it's a resource guide for civil society uh, to help make sense of how they can use SDG 16 plus in their own work. Uh, I think one of the things that we recognized uh, from the very beginning uh, when we uh, began drafting this resource is that there are many organizations around the world who have been doing this work around specific SDG 16 targets and these issues for many years and, and decades even. So I think what we want to do is provide this added value of how can people, how can organizations bring and utilize SDG 16 plus uh, in the context of their own work? How can it strengthen the work that they are already doing? Um, so that's part of the, the, the approach that we've taken with this, uh, with this toolkit. And, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, what the, the resource um, includes in, in just a second. Um, I don't think I need to talk too much about SDG 16 plus, um, you know, the value of it. Uh, I think it, a lot has been said uh, already, but I think the, the resource really um, highlights the fact that, um, you know, the, the SDG 16 plus element of it, that the interlinkages with uh, other uh, agendas, with all of the other SDGs, um, other international agreements, uh, and I'll talk about that in just a second on, on uh, some of the ways that we feature uh, that as well. Um, just in terms of how to access the resource. Um, so we've done two things. The first is where you can download the resource in a traditional uh, report style format um, for those colleagues that prefer, um, you know, following a, a resource, um, you know, from front to back. Um, but we've also uh, produced an online web platform for the resource, uh, which we hope will make the, the content a lot more easily um, accessible, a lot more digestible. Um, every single chapter has its own dedicated web page, uh, and I'll talk about some of the content that's featured on some of these pages uh, in just a second. Uh, but also, uh, we, we felt it's, it's, it's also useful to have a web platform so that we can constantly keep this content updated with the traditional report style format. Um, so for those of you that have uh, produced reports uh, on, your, on your end, uh, it's difficult to, to edit a report. Um, so what we think, uh, what we hope is that this, this uh, web platform uh, hopefully makes it a lot easier for us, for us to, uh, to update this content, for colleagues to share content and to share their experiences on this web platform that we can then uh, update and showcase over time. Um, also the web platform, having the web platform uh, has the added benefit for those of you that have 
uh, web browsers that have um, automatic translation plugins. You can also translate the, the, the web version into other languages as well, which we also hope is helpful. Um, I, I won't go into too much detail on the content of the toolkit because there's a lot to unpack here, but this is just to show uh, you know, the scale and scope of the issues that we cover uh, in this uh, resource. Um, we didn't want to cover uh, you know, how to tackle um, uh, specific targets, for example, because like I said, um, there's been a lot of work from many organizations around um, each of these topics and targets um, for decades even. But instead, we wanted to take a, a deeper dive into some of the approaches that civil society and other partners can use to actually advancing SDG 16 plus. So for, for example, you know, how do you work with um, parliamentarians? Um, why are parliamentarians important to engage with when it comes to um, you know, uh, policymaking and um, prioritizing of SDG 16 plus? Or working with national budgets, for example, um, or how to produce a, a civil society spotlight report. Um, so we wanted to focus on those uh, really specific approaches that colleagues can take um, to advance uh, SDG 16 plus in their own uh, contexts. Um, and uh, just an overview of what the chapters uh, include. So the same format for all of the chapters, uh, we really, again, wanted to focus on the practical guidance for, for our partners and, and civil society uh, colleagues around the world. Uh, again, focusing on, you know, you know, what is this approach that we're um, proposing here? Um, so practical guidance on how you can put it into practice uh, along with some tools and tips uh, and, and resources um, that you can use to think about how you can contextualize this into your own context. Um, each of the chapters also features case studies. Uh, it's also important for us to learn from the experience of others that have done this, um, either successfully or unsuccessfully. Um, uh, we want this, uh, again, the web platform here to be an opportunity for us to share experiences and to learn from one another going forward as well. So the case study aspect is also a really important part uh, of this toolkit. Uh, and then also finally, just key resources. I mean, we, we recognize that, you know, this toolkit isn't the only resource out there uh, on SDG 16 plus. It's, it's not even the, uh, the only um, ad, um, you know, uh, toolkit, policy toolkit out there. So what we wanted to do was, you know, for colleagues that wanted more information about some of these specific approaches to advancing SDG 16 plus, um, to provide some key resources for you to follow up on in case you do want to dig a bit deeper. Um, I think one of the resources that we have in the resource that I'll just briefly touch on uh, is uh, an SDG 16 target, uh, target and interlinkages guide. So going back to the SDG 16 plus aspect um, of, uh, of our discussion, that we know that SDG 16 is linked with all other SDGs and many other international agreements um, are, are relevant. Um, so we use um, the IGES uh, uh, interlinkages tool, which is a fantastic resource for those of you that haven't um, seen it um, by now. Um, and then we look at some of the international agreements that, you know, if you're working, if you're interested in working around this issue, you know, there's some su suggestions for uh, other processes that you may find entry points in as well. Um, there's a lot more to explore in that resource. I would really encourage you all to, to browse it uh, on your own time. Uh, and then it also provides an indicators guide. Uh, I think this is one of the most commonly um, requested resources from our own members within the TAP network uh, is, you know, when, when colleagues are putting together spotlight reports, for example, uh, we always get asked, you know, uh, what kinds of indicators can I use to track um, progress and report on? So what we do here is we provide, um, you know, a list of the glo official global indicators um, but then also a compendium of uh, supplemental global indicators. And, and Massimo talked a, a little bit about the role of non-official data um, previously. And, and um, you know, we include uh, not just uh, suggested indicators here, uh, but also links to the metadata and the data sources. So if you are interested in using that indicator in particular, uh, you can click through and you find all of the information you'll need um, to understand how to, to track um, towards that indicator and the data that you can use. Um, and then just finally, there's a lot that we want to do with this uh, going forward. Again, because we have this on our interactive web, web platform, uh, you can share content with us, um, whether that's key resources that you'd like to showcase on, on the platform or case studies. Um, you can express an interest in uh, you know, putting together a workshop or a training around this toolkit with us. That's something that we'll look to do uh, going forward from here. And then, of course, I think the, the main um, 
thing that you can do to keep up to date with the work that we have going forward from this uh, is, of course, to become uh, a member of the TAP network. For those of you um, who are within civil society, uh, you can join a, a growing network of, of organizations working to advance SDG 16 plus, uh, and you can stay uh, up to date on the, the things that we're doing uh, around this toolkit uh, going forward. Uh, there's obviously a lot more to this toolkit, but I would really strongly encourage you all to uh, navigate it on your own. Again, very simple to, to find. It's just sdg16toolkit.org. So um, yeah, happy to answer any questions. And I, and I really hope that this is a useful resource for uh, not just civil society colleagues, but, but other stakeholders uh, as well. And, and, and look, for, look forward to your, your feedback going forward as well. Thank you. Super, John, thank you. Um, I've also been looking through it uh, uh, throughout the day and it is super helpful in consolidating a lot of the work that has out there in a practical form. It also has some great case studies. Um, so we, uh, as, a, as a network as well as a coordinating platform, will be using it uh, to guide our work and, and look forward to seeing how it is utilized by all of you. Um, we, without further ado, we will turn now to uh, a case, a, basically a case study, uh, uh, you know, here from Syria, Sierra Leone, a civil society uh, partner of ours. Uh, his name is Mr. Musa Ansumano Soko. He is a member of the executive committee of the civil society platform on peace building and state building. And he's founder of the Youth Partnership for Peace and Development. Uh, as well as chair of the National Civil Society Network on Water and Sanitation. Uh, and he'll be speaking to us uh, today on the work that civil society has done and engaged in in Sierra Leone um, through, on reporting on SDG 16. So take it away, Musa. We have, yeah, we have some time. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> thank you so much, um, Priya, and um, thank you to the team. Um, well, our experience basically, you know, is going to look at, you know, mainstreaming as the 16 plus, you know, and the VNR process, you know, as it relates to national development processes. And so um, through this um, learning experience, I would like to share some few um, introductory part of this work that we have been doing and um, key processes, key lesson plans, as well as um, recommendations going forward. So as we all know, uh, the very guiding principle to the, the core of the SDG process and its reviews, you know, is to be able to look at um, key areas that we in fact emphasize on, like um, looking at the voluntary and country-led processes, tracking progress, you know, in a holistic and targeted way, as well as supporting reporting, you know, by all relevant stakeholders, ensuring that no one is left behind. So we felt um, these are key areas that are also significant pieces of this um, puzzle in ensuring that the guiding principles are um, well um, 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 trickled down at the, at the local level. So um, the delivery of the process generally, the SDGs, I would say, you know, as it relates to SDG 16, you know, at the country level, has equally um, 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 ex exposed a lot of you know, uh, a lot of positive as well as um, uh, gray areas or areas that we refer to as gaps. So Sierra Leone being in its third uh, uh, voluntary reviews, we have significantly improved over time, you know, until COVID struck. And so the, as you'll be going along, you definitely will see some of those um, pointers as to how um, such processes were greatly um, um, hampered. So, Sierra Leone have two accelerator goals. Well, basically these are goals that they felt could also significantly support the country's national development plan, like the medium term development framework. And so the VNR process, for example, in 2019 heralds the very new beginning to vital civil society engagement and influencing, while also deepening greater partnership for joint government civil society national consultations across the country's 16 districts. And so that very process began the actual um, enhancement of civil society um, engagement through support for the TAP network and the civil society platform for peace building and network in having 
the first national civil society SDG plus forum that we were able to also look at um, the BNR in its holistic term. And so the process in itself, we look at as a puzzle, you know, that the BNR process, you know, right through the HLPF is only a part of the puzzle, but critically allowing the vital and critical voices of civil society, like citizens and their institutions, more specifically to be able to leverage, you know, available opportunities, you know, for voices and participation as well as utilizing the outcomes to inform national development planning and advocacy. So we looked at key processes and I'm happy um, John shared the, the, the accountability toolkit. You know, prior to the SDG 16 plus toolkit, we in fact in Sierra Leone have been using the SDG accountability toolkit, you know, uh, more specifically to be able to ensure that we, we are guided in our action as well as ensuring that we are able to uh, bring influence, in, influence into the core of evidence. And um, the Civil Society Platform for Peace Building and State Building in its Ready for Review project was also significantly um, supporting that golden effort in ensuring that we are not only engaging at the level of, uh, of, of the, the government, but also bringing out the agency and, 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 and critical essence of civil society in the in the VNR process. And so the conference I talked about earlier as the first civil society forum on the VNR and the SDG basically was held in 2019. And as you can see, this is um, one of our colleagues, you know, from the TAP Network West Africa, uh, Dr. Wayne Joby, invited to Sierra Leone to be part of the process. And so right from the stakeholder mapping alignment with other civil society processes at the national level, identifying key opportunities for engagement, joint civil society and government district consultations, as well as validation of the outcomes of the VNR have all been part of the significant processes, you know, where civil societies have greatly pushed, you know, um, inclusivity as well as ensuring that no one is left behind. And more specifically, the VNR process for especially 2019 you know, was participatory, you know, where relevant stakeholders were also brought on board in ensuring that, um, you know, the, 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 the critical agency of every stakeholder is ensured. And so we, we move further to looking at, you know, the development um, framework, which is the national development um, plan, you know, in its alignment with the target of the sustainable development goals. The photos you've seen is from the Civil Society VNR um, SDG Forum, you know, that we had in Sierra Leone. And so being a country, you know, that is reporting for the third time now in a row, so they were able to develop the national development, the national uh, medium-term development framework, you know, to the targets of the SDG, as well as the goals. So each goal is pegged to uh, pillars of, the, the clusters of the, the national um, medium-term development framework. And so as you can see, you know, this is um, a, a, a really painstaking process for the government to be able to also ensure that they align. And what we do now is to be able to ensure that the alignment goes with concrete actions and commitment to deepen the, the, the critical voices of citizens in their own process. And so data for results, how have all these processes, you know, supported um, results-based planning, as well as ensuring that um, the critical um, uh, mass of citizens who are mostly left behind are brought to the fore. And so for the SDG 16 plus target, you know, we have realized that it has posed, you know, serious challenges, particularly as we face substantial gap between, you know, targets and business as usual. When you see instances of violence, you know, injustice, rights violations, and, and, and the host of others. We also look at, you know, for example, key areas, you know, that are off track, you know, when you look at the processes that we had in the consultation processes. And strategies for SDG plus data, identifying priorities for improving data over time is necessary, as well as ensuring that we strengthen data partnerships, you know, and build political, as well as, you know, secure the necessary resources for accelerated delivery. Context scenario, context-based scenarios are also very much critical, particularly when we 
you know, are also, um, I mean, very much seeing our government eager and enthusiastic in the process. But then how do we ensure that context-based, you know, um, scenarios are also helping and shaping the very process of the SDGs? And so key lessons we have learned over time, like I said earlier, data monitoring and sustainability have also been um, significantly um, earmarked during this process. And so Sierra Leone having its second full SDG report, you know, we have realized significant data gaps, you know, and these data gaps specifically are also um, um, not, you know, sufficient to disaggregating, you know, the most left behind. And so we felt there are key areas that first need to be done, for example, in ensuring that the monitoring framework, you know, is developed, you know, as well as having clear plans, you know, as to how we close the data gap. Secondly, to be able to ensure that there's the urgent need, you know, for, you know, the monitoring and review process, you know, to be able to ensure that um, statistical reporting exercises, you know, are more meaningful, you know, in reflecting progress, you know, as, as, as the country implements. And secondly, we also look at the key um, implement, uh, implementation and monitoring coherence across partners with or within government. The third aspect of it is that um, the application of the leave no one behind, we felt is also very much critical. Yes, we have in, improved on inclusivity, but we must be able to ensure that we go beyond you know, the comfort zone in ensuring that you know, the critical mass of people who are rich are also brought to the fore. Accountability of the state to its citizens is important as it is for the agency of the critical voices of civil society. And so this actually underpins the very motivation you know, behind civil society's influencing of the very process of accountability in the delivery of the goals. Musa, I'm, gonna ask you, I'm just gonna ask you to wrap up because my internet is also yes. big, huge thunderstorm here. So <laughs> we have to Absolutely. get- So I'm wrapping up. Thanks. So we, we have, few um, recommendations that we also felt are key, building on to those gaps that I, I mentioned, you know, to be able to ensure that um, we get government willingness as well as the political will to be able to ensure that the most left behind are brought to the fore and ensuring that, you know, we get the goals delivered in a way that is consistent with national reality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Musa. Sorry to rush, but you know, there's so many speakers and uh, I'm afraid my internet is going to crash. Big thunderstorm here in New York. I don't know if you can hear it through my windows. Uh, we will, without further ado, I wanted to introduce Marta Bostista Orcada. She's a program associate at Pathfinders for Peaceful, Just, and Inclusive Societies. And we work with her also. She's a very active partner of the Global Alliances as well as the SDG 16 Coalition. And we'll be speaking about national and international uh, delivery areas and what uh, and a, a variety of topics, but very much uh, connected to re rebuilding from COVID-19. Thanks, Martha. Thank you so much, Priya, and thank you so much for having me. Let me share my screen. And put up this presentation. Good. Great, thank you. Um, so thank you so much to to everyone um, for being here, also for to all the partners for have, for organizing this this learning lab. Um, today, I would like to present the Pathfinders uh, latest publication, which is called "The Dawn Is Ours: Moving Forward Together for Peaceful, Just, and Inclusive Societies." Um, this is our first annual HLPF policy brief, and we're very, very excited to be able to present it to you today. Um, the brief will actually be published and available to read tomorrow morning, and we will have an official lunch um, and an event tomorrow, and I will be uh, referring to it at the end of this presentation. So going back to the, to the publication, um, these, this annual HLPF policy brief, what it does is it reaffirms that peace, justice, and inclusion remain central to harnessing the political will, collective action, as well as the economic, as economic investments that we need, uh, or that are so much needed during the pandemic response to achieve the 2030 agenda. It navigates a path beyond recovery towards 2030, um, and it identifies the agenda, windows of opportunity, as well as pillars of action that we should unite behind to achieve 
um, to achieve measurable progress by the SDG Summit in 2023. Um, so before I get into, into the details of the publication, I just wanted to quickly introduce the Pathfinders for Peaceful, Just and Inclusive Societies to those um, in this webinar who, who don't know um, who don't know us. Um, the Pathfinders brings together 39 member states, um, as well as over 100 partners that include international organizations, civil society, as well as the private sector. We're dedicated to raising the political ambition and peace, justice and inclusion, um, so SDG 16 plus, and to speed up the delivery of, of SDG 16 plus um, targets. We have three objectives, national delivery, um, working with member states, trying to increase um, national ambition and supporting, supporting this ambition to create uh, concrete and, and ambitious actions. Um, also on international delivery, we're working to strengthen strategies and, and momentum um, at both international and regional levels. And finally, we have the, the three grand challenges, justice for all, uh, tackling inequality and exclusion and uh, reducing violence by 20, reducing global, having global violence, I'm sorry, having global violence um, by 2030. Uh, and we're working to build ambition on those three grand challenges and focusing also on, on learning. And as you can see on the slide, um, our medium goal targets the 2023 summit, as we believe that we must channel to achieve the highest mark that we can to, to reach um, uh, the summit in, in, in a couple of years. Um, just very quickly, this is the full list of the 39 governments. So I, I wanted to say that I'm very, very honored that um, the, the Minister um, of Peace and Justice, of Justice and Peace of Costa Rica, Her Excellency, Mrs. Friela Salazar Rojas, as well as um, Her Excellency, Mrs. Joana Gomez Rosamaro, Minister of, of Justice of Government of Cabo Verde are here, as both, um, both countries are, are part of the, are members of the Pathfinders. Um, so as I mentioned before, uh, the tool that um, we want to present today is this Pathfinders first annual policy brief. Just wanted to say that the title actually was inspired by the, the inspiring words of, of, of Amanda Gorman as she held um, Asher President Biden's inauguration earlier this year. Um, the brief, um, what it does is it reviews implementation of SDG 16 plus, it spotlights progress and also urgency to, to implement SDG 16 plus. So in the brief, what we do is we match the impact of COVID-19 across um, the SDG 16 target. So for example, um, for SDG, SDG 1 target 1B, um, institutions and policies for poverty eradication, we found that um, some of the statistics that we compile include that 71 million people are expected to be pushed into extreme poverty in 2020. Um, or for example, for um, SDG 16.5, um, target 5.2, which is violence against, um, against women and girls, uh, we found that domestic violence has actually increased by 30% since the start of the pandemic. Um, so to meet these challenges uh, and to deliver a people-centered recovery, we outline um, this, these policy priorities um, to achieve that. Um, we, have, we have policy priorities for each of, uh, of these three pillars, so peaceful societies, just, just societies, as well as inclusive societies. So for example, I'm just gonna highlight um, a few for each. For peaceful societies, we, we must strengthen data collection and evidence base, and we must build linkages across dimension, the different dimensions of violence. To ensure justice for all, we must put people and their justice problems at the center of justice systems, um, and we must eliminate legal, administrative, financial, as well as practical barriers. Um, to tackle inequality, well, we must renew the social contract and we must reimagine fiscal compacts and identify sources of, of revenue. So what the, the policy brief also includes um, is 
but we actually document 36 national case um, studies where Pathfinder member states are leading by example in this very um, extremely difficult times in these three areas that I just mentioned. Um, these actions provide insights and as well as inspiration for other countries that are interested in turning ambitions into tangible steps to build peaceful, just and inclusive societies. So this is just a sneak peek of, of these um, country case studies. Um, and for example, in Argentina, you know, there's been a resolution that was passed alongside some supporting procedures that exempted people at risk of gender-based violence from isolating measures when they needed assistance, judicial protection, etc. In Colombia, there is this new free tool called Legal App that was created to promote justice access to their citizens. In Germany, prioritizing the, the issue of gender-based violence, the government has continued running the National Violence um, Against Women helpline. And finally, in Liberia, for example, a new task force or a task force was created to tackle sexual and gender based violence in the country. Um, so as you can see up to the right of the slide, what we um, have done in the brief is that we outlined five ingredients uh, to generate the highest amount of actions to elevate political leadership. Um, all of it, which is necessary to move forward in the implementation of SDG 16 plus while we prepare for the upcoming SDG summit in 2023. Um, so these ingredients are first um, mobilize urgent SDG 16 plus action, two strengthen and sustain political leadership, three accelerate SDG 16 plus implementation, four sustain momentum through global advocacy, and five forced coalitions for success. So in the policy brief, we obviously go into the, you know, the nitty gritty of, of, of these five um, areas, but just as a, as, a, as a highlight, what we, what Pathfinders found is that, um, what Pathfinders found that resonates with uh, governments as well as all sectors um, is that- Hello, hello, Okay, Don Elizabeth, I'm Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Um, okay. Um, sorry. So what I was saying is that um, something that we found that resonates well with governments and and the sec and um, other sectors is mobilizing urgent as a 16 plus action around these four areas. Reduce violence everywhere significantly. Uh, ship from a world where justice is only available. Um, to the privileged few, to one that actually provides justice for all, tackle inequality and exclusion so that everyone can enjoy a fairer and more sustainable future. And finally, combat corruption, transform institutions, and strengthen good governments to meet the aspirations of current as well as future generation. Um, and finally, just to refer back to the event that I mentioned before, we'll be launching this policy brief tomorrow. Friday, July 9th at 9.15 a.m. ET, so Eastern Time, New York Time. Um, I just wanted to uh, show you some of the, of the speakers that we'll have, and we're honored to have Her Excellency Fiorella Talater Rojas, Minister Rojas, with us tomorrow as well. Um, speakers will also include His Excellency Juan Manuel Santos, former president um, of Colombia, as well as uh, Minister of National Planning and Economic Development of Sierra Leone, His Excellency Francis Kaikai, and many others. Um, my colleague Luisa will share the event break in the, the event break link in the chat. So you can see, um, so you can have more information about the event, see the full list of speakers, as well as hopefully register. Um, we hope um, that you can join and we hope to see you there. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Marta. Uh, we're wrapping that up now. We only have five minutes for questions, so I'm hoping that uh, we, a few of us can stay on a little bit longer. Um, there's a few that have been raised in the Q&A, and we will start with, uh, if the ministers are still on, I'm not sure if they are. Let me check. They might have gone off already. Um, one of the questions that came to being was, are there regional differences within countries in implementing measures? So I think the question really gets to the sense of localization. Uh, uh, are there organizations 
on this call or uh, countries that have done some work, different work, de depending on which region they are in the country. Uh, for um, Lara Zuzan, I have, uh, can you speak to, uh, and perhaps you can, but you can let us know, can you speak to synergies between the women, peace and security and youth peace and security agendas? Uh, for Agenda 2030, and particularly with reference to SDG 16 plus, uh, and how can governments integrate women, peace and security principles into VNRs and SDG implementation? And then um, um, one of the last questions was for Musa, how do we combine efforts from African civil society to present a report on the situation of the SDGs in Africa? and encourage governments to develop a realistic strategy for SDG 16. Perhaps we start with Musa, if you're still there. Yes, I am. Sorry, I didn't get that last question clearly. Uh, prior, you Hello? moved. Uh, how do we combine efforts from African civil society to present a report on the situation of the SDGs in Africa and encourage governments to develop a realistic strategy for SDG 16? Okay, um, thank you very much for, for that question. It's, it's very much important. And I think that the essence of, you know, um, North-South divide as well as South-South um, collaboration you know, North-South collaboration and South-South collaboration, so to speak. So if that is the need, and I think it's very critical, we can work a way around, you know, for example, working with key uh, global processes like the TAP network, the CSPPS, and other, um, of course, like the Pathfinders, you know, to be able to ensure that we, we build on what already exists. Already when we were in New York, you know, during the um, BNR process, we, came across several other processes, like for example, who is paying the bills, falling through the crack, you know, which the global call to action against poverty did, you know, as a whole study, you know, and that study basically was focused on European um, non-governmental organizations and how that affects Africa and other countries in the global south. So that in itself could be one way to be able to ensure that we, we build that level of collaboration and identify areas for, for, for collaborative learning and joint action. Thank you. Uh, I'll ask Her Excellency, uh, Mrs. Rojas, I see you now, if you can respond to the question about, I think, localization, if, you, if the country and the government has done different strategies for different areas uh, of the country. Con todo gusto, primero agradecer la oportunidad de compartir Creo que hay algún otro micrófono abierto. Agradecer primero la oportunidad de compartir con ustedes toda esta información y toda esta eh, experiencia de, de nosotros parece que es absolutamente eh, fundamental para los países poder tener este acceso. Les contamos que en Costa Rica trabajamos de esta forma. Nosotros tenemos una distribución de trabajo en el Ministerio de Justicia y Paz con las comunidades donde hacemos estrategias territoriales de prevención de la violencia. Lo que hacemos es estar en el terreno con la gente, escuchar lo que la gente identifica como sus problemas y las propuestas que la gente hace para solucionarlos. A partir de ahí, nosotros trabajamos elaborando las herramientas y las intervenciones que puedan atender esos problemas que la gente puede hacer. Pero un aspecto importante es que no solo trabajamos por la gente, sino que trabajamos con la gente, porque involucramos a la gente en los procesos que tienen que ver con estas intervenciones de las estrategias locales de prevención. Si bien estas estrategias son comisadas, por decirlo así, a cada una de las regiones, de acuerdo a su naturaleza, sus necesidades, suman todas de manera agregada al cumplimiento porque la medición de los objetivos del país la hace de manera agregada para todo el país, no hace diferencia para cada una de las regiones. Básicamente ese sería, me parece que esa era la pregunta que nos estaban haciendo. Quiero compartir en el chat en este momento lo voy a enviar el, el link 
donde pueden encontrar cómo en Costa Rica hacemos la medición de cada uno de los indicadores. Muchas gracias. ¿Cualquier otra consulta? Acá, acá estamos. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Dr. Lara Zuzan, did you want to take the one on women, peace and security and youth peace and security? Yes, thank you very much for this um, very important uh, question, particularly as we just concluded the Generation Equality Forum and the launch of the Women, Peace and Security Humanitarian um, and Action Compact. So I think there are certainly um, synergies to consider here. Um, as mentioned, the Women, Peace and Security Humanitarian and Action Compact would be one um, where, you know, um, Signatories can come from civil society, from national governments, um, also private partnerships, and this was just launched um, last week or so. And the other synergy that I see is through um, what I call NAP, so national level strategy documents that exist within the Women, Peace and Security um, agenda. And these documents outline objectives and activities that countries can take to secure the human rights of women and girls in conflict settings, to prevent armed conflict and violence, and um, all of this within regional, national, and development agendas, and also within, of course, agenda equality um, policies. So I think there is a lot of opportunity here also, um, since NAPs are regularly monitored and reviewed at the international level, specifically by the United Nations. So those would be my two uh, points to mention here. Thank you. Thank you. We have one uh, last question for Marta. Uh, the question is, uh, justice to privileged few, how do we plan on to monitor that? It's a tough one. How do we plan, this is for you, Marta, uh, how do we plan to monitor or how do we monitor justice uh, for the privileged? Um, yes, that's indeed a, a tricky question, um, but what I can do is I can share some of the recent publications that my colleagues at the Justice for All team um, have prepared. Um, there's actually, um, a, last year, the UN Statistical Commission approved um, a new SDG indicator that actually measures progress towards the goal of achieving justice for all. So what I can do is I can share information in the chat about that and that I hope um, response the, the the question. Thank you. Thank you. So we've uh, run out of time. Uh, I would encourage you to uh, send your questions in to uh, uh, several of us if you'd like. I can leave my email here quickly, but if others want to as well. I know UNITAR, I have to thank uh, UNITAR and UNDESA. They will put up a, a hopefully some of the presentations that have been presented here. Uh, there's a wide range of tools that were presented, uh, research uh, and advocacy messages. So we hope to use that space uh, to, to put up all this information. There's also the SDG 16 hub, which collects a lot of these uh, resources in one space. Uh, I'm grateful to Her Excellency uh, Mrs. Uh, Johanna Gomez Rosa Amado and Her Excellency Mrs. Fierola Salarza Rojas for their great contributions and for their support and their commitment. Uh, very much uh, SDG 16 champions and uh, we're really grateful for your political leadership uh, on, on this front. Uh, I'm wishing everyone a, a very safe, um, uh, a safe year ahead. I wanted to reiterate uh, um, you know, our call to action in terms of the SDG 16 coalition. Uh, we're really looking at displaying and enacting political leadership, which we've done here and we'll do uh, in the weeks to come. We're committing to a whole of society approach, which has been presented here in a, a variety of ways to ensure that government action is responsive. We are really committed to safeguarding where possible, expanding civic space and increasing public trust was what we witnessed in that uh, cloud formation. There's a realization in this group and across the world that this issue of a civic space and, and participation is, and citizen engagement is essential. We are really calling on investing in local actors, again, was demonstrated by both the governments here today, uh, as well as the case from Sierra Leone uh, for sustainable development. And we're really committed to ensuring human rights based and people centered approaches to recovery and rebuilding. 
So we continue on uh, on, on this challenging uh, path ahead and we look forward to seeing you physically, hopefully sometime soon. Be very well, be very safe. Uh, and thank you again to all.